Daniel was an amazing man. And in chapter 1 of the book of Daniel, if you found your way there, we find the first story of Daniel in chapter 1. We'll pick it up at verse 1. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And to them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Imagine four Hebrew boys, teenagers at this time, snatched from their homes in Jerusalem and moved to faraway Babylon. And since all of them were princes, they were moving from a culture and a whole experience that they were comfortable with and a comfortable life, probably, relatively, to the rest of Jerusalem and taken captive to a foreign pagan land. It's pretty tough. Sounds a little bit like going to college for most young people. It was Nebuchadnezzar's custom to take the smartest, the best, the brightest, and take them back in order to make them into good Babylonians. So because of this, we know what Daniel was like. In verse 3 it says, he was physically strong and handsome, because he had to be to be one of the ones that was picked, right? Socially experienced, well-liked by others, mentally keen, well-educated. This is, this is the kind of people that these were. So that then they're taken captive, but then they're told to conform. They're told to conform. The king wanted to force them to conform to the ways of Babylon. He wasn't interested in putting good Jews to work. He was interested in turning them into good Babylonians. Right? Keep your finger right where you are, but flip over to the New Testament, the book of Romans, chapter 12. Book of Romans, chapter 12. Because this story is not a story that is unique or ancient only. Christians face this every day, young and old. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says this, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This world is seeking to conform you into its pattern. We are assaulted by information and chatter, and noise, and experience, and influence, and directives from morning till night that either encourage us, or tempt us, or seek to command us to conform to the ways of this world. Either just a little, or a whole bunch. And we as believers in Jesus Christ, we say, well, I'm not going to do a whole bunch, man, I'm... I'm not going to go murder anybody. I'm not committing adultery. 
I'm not stealing thousands of dollars from the bank. Absolutely not. I'm, man, I'm a Christian. I wouldn't do that kind of stuff. But when you get close to the line of what is righteous and what is sin, well, you know, there's a tendency to walk right on that line and sometimes wander the wrong way a little too much. And we justify ourselves with a, well, you know, I'm not as bad as Charles Manson. Right? Everybody knows who Charles Manson is, right? That's another one of those old guy references, you know. We place ourselves and compare ourselves to someone who's much worse than we are so that we can feel better about the fact that we're not that bad. So the things that we are compromising on, well, you know, nobody's perfect. There's that grace thing. Well, that's not where Daniel was, we will find in this next passage. But I want, I want to lay the groundwork here for you to understand what were these young teenagers basically like four guys going to college or getting out of the home and having their first apartment together away from home were experiencing number 1 they were they had a new home they were no longer surrounded by the things of their god the whole culture of Judaism was intended it had fallen away from it but was intended to remind them who who god was the the celebration of the Lord's Supper we do to remember the Lord in the same way the Jews celebrated feasts, the Passover, the Feast of Tabernacles and others to remember about their God. The huge, beautiful temple of Solomon, even though it had been polluted by idolatry, still stood there as a testimony to what God had done. There were all sorts of social customs, at least social in the minds of many, though they were intended to be a sign of separating them from the rest of the world. Men were physically circumcised. The people ate kosher food. There were certain dietary laws. You didn't go out on the Sabbath and work a full day. There were restrictions. These were all things reminding them or intended to remind them of who they were. But now, boom, they are out in Babylon. The only Jews who are there now are the ones who came along with them. And this is the first deportation. So there's a small group, and it's mainly these these guys and, and guys like them who were brought for that purpose. They're in a totally new world. Today, many kind of accept the fact that, well, yeah, you know, my son went to, went to college and, well, you know, he's 18, so, you know, he's going to do those things. Yeah, my daughter, you know, has moved away and she's got her own apartment with a friend and, you know, I'm not really happy about the things that they're doing. But, you know, well, kids do that. They got to get their, you know, their wildness out of them at that time. We might have experienced that. I did in my lifetime. Of course, it was going from being really good to being bad. It was going from being bad to being really, really bad in my experience. But it was that thing with, well, I'm in a whole new environment here. I can do whatever I want. I travel a lot for my job. When I was, uh, years ago, when I was in the engineering group, I traveled a whole lot more. I was gone about two weeks out of every month. Traveling here, there, everywhere. There's a whole culture of men and women in business today who live on the road. And you know what? Hey, I'm on the road. Nobody knows me. I can do whatever I want. And I won't have anybody saying, why did I see you down there doing this? Doesn't matter. I can, I can take on a whole new persona. Don't kid yourself. There's a lot of people doing that. And maybe you in your lifetime have found yourself doing that. 
You get out from what is familiar into a new environment and you get the mentality that, well, you know, I can do whatever I want. Maybe I'll try this stuff and kind of experience it in my life. Or just drawn away, as James says in the book of James, that we our own desires draw us away. And then sin is conceived. And then death is conceived. And wait, it's worse than that because you get out of that comfortable surrounding and that protection of fellowship and accountability to family and church and responsibilities. And not only are you outside of that kind of going, well, I could do it. Well, you know, I'm kind of free. Nobody's watching. And... All the influences around are going, well, of course it's all right to do that. Well, everybody does. Well, everybody does a little bit of that. Well, you know, if it was if it was wrong, it wouldn't be legal, right? No. It's not true. Well, come on, you know, you don't want to be some kind of weirdo Christian. Like you don't do anything like that. Nobody's gonna like you. How are you gonna minister to anybody if you're like this, you know? You never drink, you never smoke, you never listen to the dirty jokes, you don't you don't steal from the company, you don't whine about your boss. Man, you know, how are you gonna to minister to people that do that all day? And I've heard those words. I've heard those words in counseling. It's a lie. It's a lie. So here they were, they're in a new home, new knowledge. Again, there's some similarity here to going away to college in a you know, coming out from a nice little Christian school, nice small little Christian school, or maybe homeschooled by your Christian family, and then boom, you find yourself at the University of Pittsburgh. I went there. It's a great institution, a great learning you can get there. But you ain't going to learn about Jesus there. You're going to learn that all that stuff is ancient books that, you know, there's that religion stuff. But here we believe in science, as if science and religion are incompatible. They're not telling you that. But when I sat through all those classes, getting my bachelor's of chemistry, yeah, I, man, I was bombarded with, you know, the philosophy of the world. This is why this is. And I could just sit there and take it in. And as my first pastor used to say, eat the meat and spit out the bones. And it ended up being a wonderful time of me learning about this world and the things that we don't see unless we have an electron microscope and see the amazing creation of God from a whole different perspective and give Him glory and honor. And these poor profs, they couldn't appreciate that. They couldn't enjoy that. They were busy trying to figure out how could this could work and expanding the timeline for development because the more they look at it, the more they realize, well, statistically, we need another couple billion years for that to work. Uh, just, you know, using good statistics and probability and stuff. And I'm going, <laughs> no, you don't. You know, it's, God can do it like that. And it is amazing what he has done. It's awesome. But that new knowledge challenges what you know. With kids, you have a choice of how you're going to educate them. In our modern U.S. world, as a believer in Jesus Christ, wanting to raise Christian children, teaching them, as the Scripture says, admonishing them, raising them up in the Lord, you got a couple choices, right? You could homeschool. That's a choice. Some people are cut out for that. Some people aren't cut out for that. You can send them to a private Christian school where you know that they will be at least to some extent insulated. I went to the equivalent of a private religious school. Back in my days, they were called parochial schools, right? Went for eight years. It... You know, I don't have to go there. Just, you know, you could, you know, it wasn't, it didn't prevent us kids from doing wrong things. And I suspect that good Christian schools try as much as they might. They don't keep good Christian kids from doing bad things, right? But that's one way to do it. 
or you can send them to public school. In any one of those things, you have to take in all of the possibilities and you as a parent have to teach your children. I grew up in a generation where it was like, well, they went to school. Didn't they teach them to do stuff there at school? I don't have to worry about that stuff. What would your teacher say? Whatever your teacher said, that's the truth. If they said you were bad, that's it. I'm going to spank you too because we could get paddled in, in school. And I experienced that. All right? It's a whole different culture today, but it hasn't changed that if you make the choice to send your child to public school, you have to accept the fact that then they are going to be exposed to not only the environment that might be challenging, but the teaching itself will challenge what you are teaching them. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I could tell you that we made the choice consciously to send our four kids to public school. And it challenged them. But it puts the responsibility on the parent to bring the balance in the same way that if you raise them insulated in a send away, protect them little school, you got to prepare them for the real world too. Sooner or later, you've got, you've got to balance that. And it is a good thing to be challenged in our belief. Well, why do you believe in Jesus? Could you in two minutes... Explain the gospel to someone who doesn't have any knowledge of the Bible or Christianity. Could you do that? You should be able to. Absolutely. But you know what? It, it could be a challenge the, the first time you do it. You, well, you know, and you start using Christian terms. Oh, no, you can't use that. They don't know what that means. You, you have to tell them without using Bible terms, Bible concepts. Oh, well, uh, uh, hmm. Yeah. It's good to be challenged knowing that our faith is based on the true reality on the rock of Jesus Christ. And it will not fall. It will not fail. We don't have to be scared that, well, I'm scared to be challenged by all this knowledge out there because, well, well, maybe it's not true that Jesus loves me. It is true. Stand on it and step out into this world. But they were challenged in this new knowledge, new home, new diets. And we go, well, okay, well, you know, they were, they're going to eat like a king. That can't be too bad, right? Well, there were two fundamental problems with it. Number one, it wouldn't be kosher. They wouldn't be holding to the kosher uh, law, dietary law. And number two, guaranteed both the meats and the wine would have been offered to idols beforehand, especially for the king. That would be an affront to these young Jewish boys if they really were going to act like Jews. And finally, they were given new names. I mean, this is like brainwashing. This is like their identity is being taken away from them. Right? Listen to this. Daniel, in the Hebrew, it means God is my judge. His name was changed to Belteshazzar, which means Bel protect his life. Bel was one of the Babylonian gods. Hananiah means Jehovah is gracious, and oh yes, he is. That became Shadrach, which means the command of the moon god. Mishael, in Hebrew his name means who is like God. Oh, I love that. I love that phrase. Who is like our Lord? Who is like God? There is none other like him. His name got changed to who is like Aku. Aku was another one of the gods. I don't know, but it always kind of reminds me of that uh, Lion King, Aku, Akuna Makata or something, Aku. But he was one of the heathen gods. Azariah means Jehovah is my helper, became Abednego, which means the servant of Nego, another heathen God. They were pulled out of everything that they knew. They were surrounded with challenges to what they believed. They were called to lay aside their dietary customs, which was more than just what we would think of as our dietary customs. And their very names are changed to no longer reflect their Lord and God, but to reflect the gods around them. They had a choice. What are you going to do with that? 
Well, pick it up at verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, Hey, I fear my lord the king was appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. This is what he's worried about. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please, test your servants for ten days. Let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you in the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies, and as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their features appeared better, fatter in flesh, than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. Now the word vegetables there in the original language is, is something like pulse or uh, something like that, and it, it refers to, a, to actually to a grain and not to like a leafy vegetable. But this whole thing is not about, you know, let's, okay, you've heard about the Ezekiel diet and Ezekiel bread. Okay, let's, let's go on the Daniel diet. You know, that's not what this is about. We all know today, vegetables are good for us, grains good for us. You know, I must have heard that a million times over the last week because of what happened on Saturday. You know, well, you need more, you need more vegetables in your diet and no more, no more barbecued ribs and all that. Oh. Right? But that's not what this is about. Because consider what happened here. Daniel said, okay, let us eat this stuff for 10 days. And then you will be able to see a difference. That, my friends, is miraculous. That's not, oh, they're, they're, they're doing healthy. You know, you start eating a healthy diet when you started with your cholesterol high over here. In 10 days... They're going to have to take your blood and look at it, and your cholesterol is probably not going to be all that much better yet. It takes a while. You get on an exercise program, and I know you can stay up real late at night and watch those weird channels and find things that you can buy that in two or three days are going to make you look svelte and 20 years younger and just, you know, wonderful, right? They're a lie. They're a ripoff, right? You know, if you're going to do that, it takes time, more than 10 days. And this was just by the appearance. He said, wow, you've been eating vegetables and drinking water and you look fatter in flesh than the ones who are eating the king's delicacies with all these meats, nice, good, fatty, salty meats. And oh, I'm starting to salivate. I can't eat that stuff anymore. <laughs> but anyway, it's not about the diet. It's about what God did and it's about Daniel purposing in his heart. You know, they could have said, well, you know... Um, Let's let's just follow through and follow with what this is doing. We have to do it. There's no other way to to eat here. We're being given a good food, and we'll just you know, Lord, forgive us, but we're just going to kind of walk that way. But Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself. That is the challenge to each one of us. Will you purpose in your heart? not to defile yourself or let yourself be defiled by this world. Stop kidding yourself. Stop compromising. Stop saying, well, in this situation, it's okay. Well, you know, this person did this to me and I didn't do this as bad back to them as they did it to me. You're just making excuses for why sin is okay. God calls us to stand in trust upon him. And that's what Daniel did. Daniel stepped out. He purposed in his heart. This is it. Now, it doesn't say here that he prayed first, which in the next story, he went to his friends and they prayed all night before, you know. But in this point, he just said, he, you know, just kind of said, okay, well, you know what? Let's eat vegetables and drink water. And in 10 days, you'll be able to see the difference. 
And I kind of wonder if he went back to his buddies. He said, well, this is what I told him. And they went, what? You told him what? Are you kidding me? He won't lose his head. We'll lose ours. But Daniel was willing to say, my God is not limited by anything. And we could eat vegetables and drink water or eat nothing and drink nothing for 10 days and God could work in us to make us stronger and wiser than all these other guys to be able to be seen by the eye. That's our God. There is nothing impossible for God. Do you remember the story of the prophet Elijah and his fight with the prophets of Baal? And he challenged 400 prophets, I think it was, of Baal to come and he said, look, all right, if Baal is God, let's worship him. Let's worship him. I will worship him. If he's God, I'll worship him. But if Jehovah is God, then we need to worship him. How about this? Simple for a God, right? Let's offer a sacrifice. Build a sacrifice, put it on the altar, but you're not allowed to strike the match. Let your God strike the match and consume the sacrifice, right? And you remember the story. 400 prophets of Baal, they come, they get the sacrifice, they're all ready to go. They start dancing around. They start doing all the kind of stuff that they do. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. Elijah starts feeling pretty good about it. He's going, well, you know, maybe you ought to shout a little louder. Maybe he can't quite hear you. Maybe you're, you know, maybe he's detained by something, you know, maybe, maybe a physical ailment has come upon him, you know, and uh, he's busy right now. And nothing happens for half a day. Finally, Elijah says, okay, now my turn. He builds the altar. He puts the sacrifice on it. And then he orders in the midst of a drought for three large dousings by water of the sacrifice. So there is no question. This is not a spark because it's so dry. This is the Lord God, Jehovah, consuming the sacrifice. And if I remember the story right, it consumes the sacrifice and the stones and the altar and everything. Elijah was willing to step out and say, yeah, God's big enough to do that. Oh, we say it all the time. Nothing is impossible for God. Do you believe that? Do you believe that enough to put that into practice in your life to say, you know what, I am challenged right now by the world is challenging me to walk this way. And I'm really considering it because it makes sense and it's not that bad a thing. And I'm just, man, I, maybe that's what I just need to do. Are you willing to go before your Lord and say, Lord, I know you don't want me to live in sin. I know you don't want me to commit acts of unrighteousness. So, Lord, show me how not to do that. And I am willing to stand upon you and expect miracles from you or expect you to do nothing and this to cause me great pain and anguish. But that means you are working in me. That's the faith of this man, Daniel. We're going to see where he put himself in two other situations in the chapters coming up that were much more intense than this. But this is a teenager. This is a teenager. And he purposed in his heart. And what happened because of that? Verse 17. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all the literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days, you know, they, they had a three-year course of study. When the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. They have to do their oral exam before Nebuchadnezzar to pass the University of Babylon, basically. The king interviewed them, and among them none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And therefore they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. And thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. And that verse 21 I love too. Not only did Daniel purpose in his heart, but Daniel continued. Daniel continued. Again, 
referencing something Pastor Chuck has written. I've hear, heard him say it several times. Use this analogy many times. You go on the 4th of July and watch the fireworks, and it's spectacular. And it's so much fun, and the whole crowd's going, ooh, ah, you know, it's just, it's amazing what they, what they can do with the fireworks. But it's a moment. It's spectacular. It, it makes us go ooh and ah, but it's a moment. And when the fireworks die down, what's left? The stars. The stars and the moon in that nighttime sky, steady, continuing, constant, reliable, right there. God's not looking for us to be a firework, to really impress Him and, okay, I'm going to do this thing for you this time, God. He's looking for us to walk very circumspectly and consistently. He's not looking for us to become microwave Christians. He wants us to become farmers. He doesn't want us to just dial it up two minutes, ding, it's done. He's looking for us to grow fruit in our lives. And that takes day in, day out. Steady, constant. It doesn't happen. Bing, bang, boom. It happens bit by bit, step by step. And we're going to see in this man, Daniel, a tremendous testimony of what happens when you will stand against the flow of the world, determined not to be conformed or squeezed into the world's mold, but rather to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. Thank you, Lord, for giving me another Sunday to share with this congregation. Lord, I'd like lots more, but that's up to you. Father, I thank you for your word and I thank you for the testimony of our brother, Daniel. Lord, help us to stand against the flow of this world that seeks in every moment to squeeze us into its mold. Let us determine with strength of faith to stand firmly upon your word, to purpose in our hearts not to let this world defile us and to continue and to see how you will, regardless of our situation, bring glory to your name through us. Speak to our hearts and show us, open our eyes to the things that we need to set aside because they are merely encumbrances and help us to run with endurance the race that is set before us. And now may the Lord God richly bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine on you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace each and every day of your life. Through Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and our Savior and our King, who is on his way here soon. Amen and amen. God bless you.